I'm Jeff Spence from Jefferson's Alumni Office, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's online talk, exploring some of the research and advancements in the fight against cancer. Tonight, our speakers will share impacts from the field of immunology, including some of the valuable research, discoveries, and trials occurring at Jefferson. Our speakers are Dr. Babar Bashir and Dr. Adam Lujimbal. Dr. Bashir is an assistant professor in Jefferson's Department of Oncology and in the Department of Pharmacology and Experimental Therapies. He has significant experience in translational cancer research and his laboratory research is focused on the pathophysiology of silencing tumor suppressors in colorectal neoplasms. He is also the principal investigator for several clinical trials in Jefferson's early drug development office. Dr. Lujimbal, who completed his residency at Jefferson in 2012, is an associate professor in the university's department of otolaryngology and specializes in the care of patients with benign and malignant tumors of the head and neck. He is also the co-founder of the Head and Neck Global Initiative for Surgical Mission Work. And now we'll begin our talk with Dr. Lujimbo. All right. I don't know if we can share a video here. I'm gonna try sharing my screen. Let's see. Can you hear me? Yes. Good deal. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Good. Okay. Good deal. All right. Well, I'm glad I get to hang out with everybody tonight here to get, give a talk a little bit about what, where we've been and where we're going. Um, since the alumni, the category of alumni is so broad, <clears throat> broad my hope for this talk is really to be a journey and not to get too much into the weeds. Uh, before we start, I would like to um, just mention in memory of, of Uli Rodick, uh, a dear mentor of mine, someone I met with for, for uh, basically weekly since I left fellowship. And as many of you know or may not know, um, Uli passed away uh, about a week or two ago. So for all of you mentors out there, um, I miss Uli dearly and um, we're going to miss uh, his guidance and uh, continue to mentor all of us that need it. So in his memory, uh, the following, let's talk. So first, why are we doing this? And, and, I, and, and it's kind of silly sometimes to state the obvious, but really, what do we see when we look at a patient? As a, as a surgeon, when I go in the room and I see a patient like this, and this gentleman here um, comes in with a laryngeal cancer, he also has concomitant prostate cancer, and you know what's going through his mind? and what's going through my mind when I see him and what's my job as his clinician. And I, and I really see it as my job is to get him across the river. There's a river in front of him that he's gonna to have to go across. And, and if I'm a good uh, keeper of the boat, I'll be able to get him there. And, and all these processes, you know, obviously these patients are kind of the lifeblood of what we do as clinicians, whether it be the food they bring or the things they give. Um, we know behind the scenes, is a whole entire network and process of, of things churning and moving and trying to work on behalf of this patient. Um, and I know on this phone call, there's going to be scientists that work uh, incredible hours in trying to understand discovery. And I want you to understand that behind all that uh, in sitting in the chair is that person um, that's desperate. As a surgeon, what's my perspective? So this is a, as a young surgeon, I came in, I see myself as a wood splitter, right? I got an ax, I got some wood, and I know how to chop. And I can chop all day, all night, and I love it, and it's great. Problem is, um, it's pretty barbaric, and it is amazing what we do to patients. And it's kind of, it's interesting, it, it struck me as a resident the vibrato that we have in our training of being a surgeon um, really is gonna be something of the past, I think, as we start to see the amazing intricacy of what happens at a, at a uh, immunologic, molecular, biologic level as we start to all understand this better. Um, this picture here is one of my first patients I treated. He was 48 years old. He's got these four kids. He brought them all in. He had stage four oral cavity cancer. I did a total glossectomy, 
and bilateral neck dissections, his disease survival was roughly um, somewhere in the order of about 40%. And uh, he survived it, and, um, and he's still with us today. But um, I, I, I bring these pictures up really for all the scientists in the room to remember why we're doing this. This is, it's for them. Um, so as we see patients come down the street and we, we interact with them, we're really trying to focus in on what is the one thing that the patient in front of us needs and what's the biology and what's the immunology of their tumor. And so over the process of my early career, I developed and went through this process of trying to come up with funding and developing a track record. So before we start building the track record, we got to understand some, some, some concepts of building a team. So I'm going to give you this slide right here. All of us remember as kids, now this is probably a dated slide because race cars don't look like this, but when I was a kid, this was my favorite game to play on the computer. And we, we knew which car we wanted. We wanted the one with the best nitro and speed and power and acceleration. Man, that was our car. And we knew all the specs for all the different types of cars out there. In the same way as we build teams of clinicians and scientists and therapists, we, we have to understand our strengths. So as a surgical oncologist, right, I'm really not great at some things, but I'm really good at referral sources and control of tissue. Um, and as we build a team and we look at the different components and we see the strengths of each other, we start to realize that uh, we all need to, to really build uh, this supercar um, and this uh, to be able to be successful. So this is the working group that makes up our supercar of squamous cell carcinoma and, and the work towards um, studying and learning about the immunotherapy and the metabolism of these tumors. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about the vehicle. So we talked a little bit about who's driving the car and who's, who's part of the car. Let's talk about um, a, 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 something that really I think is impactful as, as clinician scientists is thinking about this novel thing of a window trial. We all understand this, this chart here. This is not new. You all understand as we go through um, the phase one trials are really way down here in advanced disease. Patients are ready to pass. They've had multiple courses and they've failed. And we're in this phase one category. And we work our way back to phase three as the patient is healthier and back to normal tissue. The beauty of the window trial of opportunity that I have found to be exceedingly helpful in jumpstarting things is, is you can get your your test or, or your your um your trial into the patient in an earlier stage so why window trials they're investments we want to understand some of the biology and we also want to understand some of the mechanisms and some of the ways our therapeutics affect patients in a safe way so it allows us to maintain the standard of care and i and i bring this up as a if there's anybody on the on the call tonight that's working with teams I want to just throw it out there as something to consider and when you build your program or as you continue to build your program, the value of these trials. They give you the standard of care, they allow you to test therapeutic options, they're quick accrual, and they have some advantages of sub subgroup analysis. You can understand um, a little bit about it and you also get a go or no-go strategy at the end of it in a very short amount of time. And you're not waiting for um, those results that you need for the phase one, two, and three. This is not to get rid of them. It's simply to say, what's the science here behind what's going on? It also gives you the ability as a young clinician and a junior investigator to build the capacity to tell industry that you have the ability and the capability to do something meaningful. So application. So we have, I'm going to just tell a quick story about our application of nivolumab and tadalafil. Uh, tadalafil being Cialis. And so first off, I'm not going to spend time tonight talking about immunotherapy in great depths. This is more of a story and a journey. Um, we understand in, in the, the concept that naive T cells get presented an antigen, they become activated. And we know that these activated T cells can then attack tumor cells, and they have the capacity to do it. Um, and we also know that these T cells are often thwarted by the immune system's ability to keep a check on it, call them checkpoint uh, inhibition. And so um, and I'm sure Barbara can go over some in, in greater detail some of this, um, the science behind that. And certainly there's a whole entire lecture we could give on the concept of immunotherapy. But one of the big questions that's out there is we know immunotherapy has an effect on a subgroup of people, but there's a whole other group of people that it, it really doesn't touch. And it's almost as if taking the brakes off the car is not enough. So we asked the question, what are other things out there that we could augment with this that might rev the engine, if you will? So 
uh, the Cialis and Viagra, which seems kind of weird that we would choose that, and I'll go over why. So we wanted to tip the balance of the immune system from this concept of the immune system creating an escape um, environment for which tumor can grow and start to move it back towards equilibrium and eventually to elimination. So we're trying to tilt the balance, if you will. So two groups, one out of um, Miami and one out of Hopkins, discovered that Tadalafil has a remarkable effect on the immune system's um, microenvironment. And um, in short, uh, for the scientists out there, it tends to downregulate the MDSCs. You don't want these. These are the these are kind of the, the cells that hold back and cause some inhibition. It also reduces the T regulatory cells, which also does the same thing and increases some of the CD8 positive cells. It reduces arginase, as you can see here, and again reduces INOS. Both of these things are inhibitory um, for the immune system to be effective. So in short, in summary, Tadalafil is affecting the immune system based on two different studies, both in clinical patients showed an increase in CD8 positive T cells. These are the effector cells that are gonna boost um, IL-2 production as well as a decrease in these cells we don't want and um, ultimately priming an action. So when I sit with a patient in the clinic or have this trial to offer them, I say, listen, you know, the checkpoint inhibition is gonna take off the brakes of the car, but if it's sitting on level ground, it isn't going anywhere. What we want to do is we either want to rev the engine or put it on an inclined plane. And that's what we're trying to do with the doublet, the second agent. Now, as we think about this and we want to test this hypothesis, we don't have time to run a phase one, two, and three trial. We want to know if it's worth it or not worth it. We want to know if it's causing an effect or not. Should we invest in Tadalafil as a possible immune activator in the setting of checkpoint inhibition? Thus, the window trial. So here's the window trial format. We throw them in one-to-one, -one, randomized, we stratify, we give them basically four weeks of therapy, keeping them within the window of standard of care, and then we operate. We have pre and post specimen, we can compare and contrast. So here's our patient number one, day zero. This is the patient's lateral tongue cancer right here. We give one dose of nivolumab, the patient takes Tadalafil daily or Cialis, and we see a start to involute and eventually comes down to a small nubbin of tumor, um, basically an 80% treatment effect. Patient number two, again, this is, this is the first time as the, if you will, the wood splitter who was a naysayer and certainly thought my craft to be the craft of choice, right? I'm passionate about what I do. I love to split wood and man, if you got a tumor, I know how to take it out. And here, this patient here really blew my socks off. This is a T2N2 um, squamous cell carcinoma and this is four weeks later. He's got a little tiny node here. We take the tumor out. We look pathologically. This is the remnant. This is all giant cell reaction. All he's got left is this little tiny bit of malignancy out of a, I think it was a six centimeter tumor. So in four weeks, two doses of that plus daily Tadalafil, this thing just melts away. And I was blown away. It was so exciting. Um, nonetheless, I started to realize that uh, axes and uh, wood splitting are going to be a thing of the past, but needless to say, it was so cool to see this happen in, on this patient. Equally impressive, right, is this patient here. This patient comes in. This is a T1 cancer, a little creeper coming up along the soft palate, and he didn't respond at all. This is his after his treatment. I, I'm sorry, I don't have the follow-up picture, but it's identical. He actually progressed a little bit. So in this window of opportunity trial, when we think about them, they're equally, um, any patient that comes through the gauntlet on this trial is valuable, right? Because we want to know who are the responders and who are the non-responders. This patient didn't respond at all, um, as you saw the previous ones they did, so they're both valuable. Um, this is just a note on safety. It was an exceedingly safe trial. We finished all 50 patients in about um, 15 months, um, and so a rapid accrual um, um, main uh, side effect was headache, as we'd expect in the Cialis group. So here's our outcome. All right. So this is the clinical outcome. This is pathologic response. So how well did we do resolving these tumors in all these patients? So this is one through 44. We ended up having six drop out. So we have a valuable data through 44 patients. And you can see that the distribution, um, this is pathologic. So this is a CR 100. You had four complete responses. We had a whole bunch that were between 20 and 100, and we had a whole bunch that were below 20%. So we have this 
distribution of response to an immune therapy in a um, single um, cancer diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma. So there, there got to be some profile here that we need to find um, that will tell us more about the biology of how this immune system is going to respond to the treatment. Also of note, tadalafil being red, you can just see it. There's really no effect clinically here in this trial that tadalafil is doing bubkis. It isn't changing anything clinically. We're going to see that it changes something in RNA in a minute. Um, uh, to complete the story about the window trials, as you think about them, you can start to really use it in a novel way. So here we see this four-week window, and we decided our next trial, which is going to use IDO inhibition. So I'm using uh, BMS 986205. We have up to, I think, 10 patients on this trial. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at the four-week mark. If they're a responder, I'm going on for another four weeks, continuing the treatment, then surgery. If they're a non-responder, then they go right to surgery. So you can see the creativity you can use in your trial design. Um, to um, really push the envelope a little bit to see if you're maybe just not waiting long enough to see that response immunologically. Um, some interesting things we found on our data from the Nevo Tadalafil trial, we see a huge, really weird thing. We see this um, pathologic treatment effect that's very discordant. So you get 100% response in this lymph node, same patient, one level over, basically no pathologic treatment effect. So We've got two nodes, same neck, same patient, one with remarkable response and one with no response. Why in the world is that happening? Again, this is hypothesized generating. This allows us to write grants, move forward and think bigger about how people fail, right? To see this in one patient, this is the node that's gonna stick around and cause this patient to fail if we move to a complete immunotherapy um, um, uh, uh, technique of treatment. Um, where wood splitting is still necessary. We still need to go take these lymph nodes out. Um, so any, anybody out there that thinks surgery is on the way out, I'll be here for a while. Um, so here, this is just a picture here. We have a third of them that are concordant, and we have a third of these patients that are discordant. And man, I'd love somebody to tell me why this is happening. It is so cool. But we have these lymph nodes that have major responses, and then right next to it, primary site of the other lymph node has like no response in this middle third. Um, so pretty, pretty fascinating discovery, which I don't seem to have a grasp on why this is happening. Uh, and then finally, the correlative outcomes that we have, this is where our scientists really shine. Um, in our group, opposed to being one lab, we've used the Jefferson model of kind of collapsing ourselves into a working group, which involves people from dermatology and from the molecular side of things, from um, our metabolomics um, core and um, uh, the immunology core, and they all contribute their part uh, to think through each of these problems. So this is some, I'm not going to spend much time on these, but just to show the value of the, um, what you can get out of this. And you can certainly see Tadalafil is doing something, uh, as you see in this, uh, this um, heat map here, in these immune markers, um, in the HPV positive group. Um, and this is pretty awesome here. This is TCR beta chain predicting a response. And this is strong. I mean, this the, if you if the TCR beta chain, if you're able to sequence that out, and this is from PBMCs versus tumor, and you can see that you can predict who the responders and non-responders are going to be. And we could spend a whole half an hour on each of these slides. The point is not for me to talk more about the science, but just show the power of correlative science um, and using window trials to achieve that goal. Again, here's some um, further data. Um, uh, Larry Harshine's done some great work for us, taking out and pulling on exosomes and trying to find um, uh, uh, markers of immunity within the exosome profile. And he's able to gate for those. And here again, another uh, clinical response, how they're doing non-responders, responders, and the different checkpoint inhibitions on these exosomes. So in conclusion, benefits of a window trial format. I think in, when you, if, if you're out there and you're trying to think, how do I build or augment my program? I have this really neat drug in the pipeline that I want to test or try to figure out, but it's, it seems like it's impossible to do. Consider the window fat trial format as an opportunity. Work with your surgeons. I know we're wood splitters, but shoot, we can learn new, new, new things and we can be wowed by what you have. Two, the value of the scientists and the clinician working together 
is designing trials, maximizing correlatives is, um, is an awesome work and clear differences in responses to immunotherapy are out there and we need to understand why they're out there and we need to understand how we can better predict. And at the end, we have to have this vision that staging of cancer will transition from size and location to biologic characteristics. I know we're all talking about that, but I can't wait until I can stage someone on their biology and not on the size of their tumor. Um, so, you know, conclusion, it's about our patients, the cheese they make and they bring. I wish I could share all this cheese with everybody, um, but um, maybe I should be more giving to my scientists. They don't seem to see this as much as I should. I feel a little guilty. Um, and then wood splitting, you know, there's two different ways you can split wood. You can buy this fancy hydraulic machine that just pushes out the wood through there and just, man, that's fast. Or you can work with a team. And I, I prefer the team approach. Um, but we need to buy the fancy machines and we got to have them so that we can, we can um, do this and, and figure out these answers. So thanks all for, for listening. I'm going to hand it over to uh, Dr. Bashir and um, um, I look forward to taking questions afterwards. Well, thank you, Adam. That was that was great, and um, thank you, everyone, for for joining in um, this talk today. Um, I'm just gonna start sharing my screen. Can everybody see it? I'm gonna take that as a yes. Um, so, you know, I think uh, what uh, Dr. Lugenbold did was, you know, present a great uh, segue for me to, you know, continue the talk. I think the, the, the I wish I, I had uh, more opportunity to do window trials in the GI cancers, you know. Um, maybe, you know, uh, I was thinking through the presentation, I can swap the place and come to head and neck cancer. It kind of sounds so cool. Um, but I think it's a, it's a great uh, uh, way to think about, you know, because we do neoadjuvant chemotherapy a lot in GI cancers, and that may be, you know, a way to go, you know, to kind of add to this window of opportunity. And a lot is happening in that space, actually. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a little bit background on the immunotherapy, um, and specifically, you know, kind of um, talk it into why I think immunotherapy has revolutionized cancer care, um, and especially what is the role of uh, cancer vaccines, um, which, which I think it's the up and coming uh, in this field. Um, so just kind of a brief uh, background, um, immune effector cells, I think Dr. Lugenbohl clearly mentioned, uh, there are various players. Uh, the biggest ones that we tend to leverage are the T lymphocytes. And this is the kind of, you know, very basic immunology, how T cell produce anti-tumor responses. And at the heart of it is really, you know, having a cancer cell antigen through mutation um, that is unique and that can drive um, recognition of that antigen through professional APCs and drive the production of cytotoxic T lymphocytes that can infiltrate and traffic into the tumor resulting in tumor destruction. Now, you may, you know, this, this is obviously an oversimplified approach of looking at it, but you may think, you know, if, if immune system was that effective, why do people can't get cancer in the first place? So the answer is, it is actually very effective, but it is effective uh, on the both ends of the, of the, of the, and it's a double-edged sword. Too much immunity is not, not good for humans. You know, you develop autoimmunity and you develop kind of immune response against your normal tissues. Um, so there, there has to be kind of a way to dampen down that immune response. And that's where the immune um, checkpoints come in. And this is just, you know, a, a figure to, you know, illustrate the cancer cell in the middle and the T cells of the immune effector cells attacking it. Um, but that, you know, dampening of the cancer immunotherapy is through these immune checkpoints. Now, to date, I think we have almost 50 candidates of uh, immune checkpoints that really dampen the immune response at the core of, you know, having these checkpoints as a normal physiological control on the antigen presenting cells is a normal mechanism to avoid autoimmunity. But what tumor cells do, they, they take a leverage and advantage of this immune checkpoints and they tend to you know, dampen the immune response so 
it's in benefit of the tumor cells because they they keep the T cells away and uh, avoid killing by those T cells, and which is where the immune checkpoint inhibitors enter in. And I've highlighted the the PDL1, PDL2 pathway, and the discovery, you know, of the of this PD1 actually had the Nobel Peace Nobel Prize in Medicine given to um, Jim Ellison in 2018 for for this remarkable discovery because, um, and I'm just showing a very illustrative example here. Um, for metastatic melanoma, which is a type of skin tumor, the classical chemotherapy, the best it can do is, you know, on an average, it can offer a median overall survival of almost 11 months. But when this chemotherapy was compared with a PD-1 inhibitor, um, nivolumab, the trial resulted in such a significant increase in median survival that, you know, at the time that the trial was read right in 2015, they couldn't even reach the median survival. So everybody, you know, um, on average was living longer um, and the hazard ratio for death was significantly reduced by almost 58%, which is, which is a great, um, you know, uh, hazard ratio for, for any clinical trial and drug approval. So, not to speak that, you know, nivolumab did wonders here, and it has really revolutionized how we, cure, how we treat uh, patients with metastatic melanoma. But that's not, that's, that was where the immunotherapy really sprung into action. And over the next, you know, over the last decade, we have seen so many approvals of immune checkpoint inhibitors across a variety of cancer types, you know, um, building on to Dr. Uh, Logan Ball's talk, you know, squamous cell, head and neck cancer. We have first line, second line, um, and immunotherapy performing kind of better than the traditional chemotherapies, melanoma, skin cancers, and the list is on and on. But what I want you to get from this list is unfortunately, it does not have a lot of GI cancers that I treat. And that is, you know, kind of the, 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 the un, unfulfilled paradigm of immunotherapy success because some cancers obviously do respond very well to immunotherapy, but um, not so much in the GI space. And particularly um, the, those that do respond are, are in, the, in the minority here. But, you know, one thing to, to, to remember about immune checkpoint inhibitors, they are great. They have revolutionized cancer care, but they come with a bag of side effects. And this slide is just kind of uh, referring you to the, to the earlier um, thing I mentioned about autoimmunity and what it means to control the immune system. And having a checkpoint inhibitor really makes your immune system out of control. And when it does go out of control, you can see the you know, list of side effects across various organ systems. And sometimes they can be really debilitating and can lead to patient's death. And um, fortunately enough, you know, we, we have steroids, we have drugs to, to dampen down the immune response. Um, and you know, we, we tend to manage it, but it's, it's just to say that you know, there are adverse effects that come with checkpoint inhibitors um, although it has revolutionized the cancer care, but you know it, it does come with with a significant burden. Um, so then I want to kind of you know move into why I think therapeutic cancer vaccines are are, are great um, um, great therapeutic uh, next step. And um, it's kind of ironic because um, therapeutic cancer vaccines are not a new concept. Um, Dr. Coley in 1891 is considered to be the father of immunotherapy, um, discovered in some of his patients who had um, tumors in the neck, such as sarcoma or lymphoma. And he noticed that some of the patients had, you know, skin abscesses or skin infections. And for some reason, their tumors started to shrink. Um, so, you know, obviously, not a lot was known at that point about immunotherapy, but he came up with this novel idea that, you know, okay, he started getting live inactivated strep pyogenes and serratia marcissans, um, and he directly, directly started injecting into patients' tumors, and lo and behold, he started seeing that some of the tumors actually did regress. Um, obviously, you know, there wasn't a lot of mechanistic explanation at that point, but Coley's toxin was, uh, was a you know, um, a good, good start of immunotherapy and how we kind of have come to learn about 
the various aspects of it. But over the next hundred years, really nothing so dramatic has happened in the space of therapeutic cancer vaccines. And the only couple of examples I can give you is one is the tuberculosis vaccine, uh, BCG, which is primarily used in, in the developing world uh, to prevent TB, but in, in, in um, particularly in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, we have seen that injecting the BCG vaccine uh, into, the, into the bladder actually prevents the recurrence of very early stage bladder cancer. It is an effective strategy and it is continued to be used uh, as of today. Uh, but you know, it's, it's a very limited set of patients who derive benefit from this. Um, and it does involve you know, um, the direct injection. Um, but, but at the heart of it, what TB vaccine is doing, it's, it's inducing T cells at the site of the disease and that induction of T cells then prevents the cancer to come back. Um, another example is the Cipolucil T, which is, which is basically a personalized cancer vaccine. Um, what, what here you do is you basically get dendritic cells from the patient through a process called leukophoresis. You know, attach them to a machine and blood runs through the machine and extracts those cells. Um, and then they're taken to a central laboratory. And here, those patient-derived cells are treated with, you know, GMCSF and uh, a, a prostate cancer antigen called uh, prostatic acid phosphatase. What it does, it basically activates this immune cell. So you then, you know, kind of bag it, ship it back to the, to the, to the patient, and is administered back into the patient intravenously. And it does attack uh, prostate cancer. Um, so in a way, Provenge um, vaccine platform, what it does, it trains your immune system to seek out and attack prostate cancer cells. And uh, the benefit was observed in, in a cohort of patients uh, who did get uh, Cipolucil T. They tended to live longer. Their three-year survival was longer compared to those patients who didn't get the vaccine. And that led to the FDA to approve the Cipolucil T in 2010 um, for a very specific indication, and that is asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic metastatic gastroid-resistant prostate cancer. Now, you know, you would expect that this, this uh, success would lead to explosion of uh, Cipolucil T in other, other areas of prostate cancer, but unfortunately it has not. Um, and part of it is, you know, it's just so costly to produce this vaccine. The scale of production and the delay in the delivery of the vaccine is, is such that it has not led to other clinical trials um, looking at the efficacy of this uh, vaccine in, in other aspects of prostate cancer or other cancers uh, for that matter. And, and here, you know, I want to kind of um, introduce you to the concept of what are cancer vaccines. Actually, it's, 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 it's a various, various types of cancer vaccines. The one we, we discussed previously, the prostate cancer vaccine, is a type of cell-based vaccine. Um, you know, you um, train your patient's own immune cell, an antigen-presenting cell here, and then it is um, given back to the patient. As you can see, it is very highly immunogenic, and you can control the antigen presentation, but it is expensive and it is difficult to produce. Um, and obviously, with the leukophoresis, there are always risk of you know, damaging the patient or, or having any, any side effects. Now, other, another interesting area of vaccines is the viral or bacterial-based vaccines. And here you're basically leveraging um, the natural ability of a virus um, to infect cells. Um, that's what viruses do. And um, you know, it's, it's ironic that we're talking about viruses during this COVID-19 pandemic, but um, viruses have been a great vehicle for vaccines. And I'm not talking about the therapeutic cancer vaccines, the vaccines in general that we get for immunization, a majority of them are live attenuated viruses. Um, they are very highly immunogenic. They are easy to produce on a large scale. There is a potential that they can cause high toxicity and risk of undesired infections or immune response against the vector. 
that is a patient will have an immune response against the virus and that will neutralize it. And some other you know, um, approaches are protein or peptide-based vaccine um, and gene-based vaccines. There was a lot of interest in gene-based vaccines. Uh, we at Jefferson actually um, uh, participated in a couple of clinical trials of gene-based vaccines. But the problem is that you know they're they're not very immunogenic in humans, and you know it, it kind of looks very promising theoretically, but they're they haven't led to um, a lot of success stories, um, and a lot has been tested out there. Um, so here, you know, with this introduction of viral-based vaccines, I'm going to talk about some of the some of the exciting stuff we we have um, been doing at Jefferson and. Uh, so that is, you know, um, using guanolyl cyclase C or GUCY2C as an immunotherapy target in GI cancers. Now, you know, to scale, to identify the scale of the problem, GI adenocarcinomas are the cause of 20% of all cancer-related deaths and 5% of all deaths in the United States. So really heavy burden of disease. But if you look at GUCY 2 c it is expressed not only in colon cancer, um, well, it is universally expressed in colon cancer, it is also expressed in metastases that originate from colon cancer. And, you know, here on this immunohistochemistry, all the brown is your GUC by 2 c um, But recently we started seeing in our lab that, you know, there is expression of um, GUCY 2 c in pancreatic cancer. Um, and when we probe the, the cancer genome atlas network, we do see that, you know, compared to normal colon, obviously colon cancer has very high expression of GUCI2C. But we also start to see some expression in esophageal and gastric and pancreatic cancers. And obviously these tissues normally do not express uh, GUCI2C. So our thought here is that because of the because of the uh, metaplasia that happens now this is primarily squamous epithelium and um, the metaplasia to adenocarcinoma results in expression of gusi 2 c and we can leverage that as an opportunity to you know use it as a target uh, against these cancers potentially so um the viral vector, how they work, um, is kind of uh, pretty straightforward. But um, you know, imagine this is this is a cartoon of a virus, and uh, with genetic manipulation, you have introduced the the transgene that is able to express the gusi 2 c um, on the surface. Um, when you inject this vaccine into uh, a muscle, for example, uh, what it will do is it will infect the muscle and the muscle will start transcribing that transgene that you had put in the virus. Um, that cellular expression of GUC um, Y2C will result in you know, um, breakdown of some of the cells, release of uh, GUC2C receptor into the, into the, into the microenvironment. And here, professional APCs such as dendritic cells would take it up and um, package it in the grooves of the MHC and in the presence of other co-stimulatory pathways, it will, so to speak, train your native immune cells, such as T cells, to start and produce um, specificity to identify gusi 2 c And in the hope that this T cell will then surveil the, the body and wherever it finds the cancer cell expressing gusi 2 c it will kill it. Um, so kind of, you know, a way to think about it is, you know, how you prevent uh, flu, for example. You know, you give patient a flu shot, it produces uh, a, a, a T cell response against the flu antigen and prevents flu from happening, hopefully. And same concept here, you give the patient a vaccine with gusi 2 c and you train the T cells and you basically, hope that the, the recurrence will be prevented. So with this, with this mechanism, we did see um, significant preclinical proof of concept. So here we have uh, gusi 2 c vaccination in mice. Um, and I want you to focus on the lower half of the diagram first. So this is the control mice. 
Um, and this is the mice treated with the Rusi 2 c um, vaccine. And as you can as you can see, the tumor burden is is a lot less here, and numerically, you know, expressed here. Uh, but also, the mice who got the Rusi 2 c vaccine tended to live longer than the mice who did not. Now, remember, all of these are are mice that were given tumors by the experimenters, and then you know, given control versus vaccine to to measure these tumor numbers and survival curves. But immunologically speaking, um, all the mice who got the gusi 2 c uh, did develop significant amount of CD8 T cells um, compared to the control mice, but they also develop um, antibodies against gusi 2 c as well as CD4 T cells. So this was exciting data and it led to our phase one clinical trial um, of uh, ADD5 GCC partner vaccine uh, that was done um, almost five years ago. Now, in, in this kind of cartoon, what, what I'm showing you is that we are using the extracellular domain of the gusi 2 c as the virus uh, transgene, and the Padre is a CD4 epitope um, to, you know, induce helper T cells. And this is kind of, you know, expressed through a CMV expression cassette within the adenovirus serotype 5. Um, so in this clinical trial, we recruited 10 patients, uh, early stage colorectal cancer, um, and uh, we just gave one vaccination and we followed the patients for six months for mainly safety and um, immune responses. Um, so there were immune responses after the ad 5 GCC partner vaccination. Um, these are two representative patients. Um, in patient one, 1008, you can see that um, the Gusi 2 c uh, you know, can, compared to the DMSO control, did produce significant T cell responses against GCC, uh, but also against the other, other expressed epitopes, the, the Padre and the adenovirus. And the same is true for patient 1007. Um, there is kind of a decrement over time. The immune response uh, tends to kind of decrease. And here we, we observed these patients for six months, so we, we know within that time frame what happens immunologically. Um, and this, this was kind of a, a, a good thing for us because, you know, first we, we kind of, you know, it was a proof of concept for, for this type of vaccination that not only it's theoretically what we think it is, it is actually happening in patients. Um, and, but the, there, was a, there was a problem and uh, actually, um, this here is a good illustration of what happened. You know, you kind of imagine uh, ad adenovirus 5 as a very common cause of common cold in human population. And naturally speaking, you know, something as common as common cold could have pre-existing neutralizing antibodies against the vector. Uh, and this is exactly what we saw in these patients that, you know, patients in this, in this figure who had high neutralizing antibody titers against adenovirus 5 had a higher degree of neutralization of adenovirus 5. And because they have higher degree of neutralization of the vector, you don't see any immune response in, in those patients. And that makes perfect sense um, uh, when we looked at the data, but obviously, you know, had not expected it because um, alert, not a lot was known at the time that we, we did this. Um, so, but that, that kind of, you know, generated a lot of thought process and how we can circumvent or mitigate this. Um, one thing I, before I move on to the next slide, I want to mention is it was an extremely safe vaccine. No patient had any serious adverse event. It was the only significant adverse event was, you know, local irritation or some skin changes or reactions. Uh, none of the patients became sick or ill. Uh, or had untoward consequences. So the next iteration of our vaccine actually uses that uh, seroprevalence of common cold. So we know from literature review that the adenovirus 5 serotype has a seroprevalence in general population more than 70%. So 70% of the patients may not even have a chance to see the transgene inside this vector because they have neutralized the vector in the first place. Uh, on the other hand, adenovirus 35 um, is not that common. And because it's not that common, the seroprevalence is down to 10%. And 
And when, what we came up with was, you know, use the fiber or the surrounding structure of the Agnovirus 35 and replace it on top of Ag5. So kind of make a chimeric version of the virus called Ag5 F35, where we think that the neutralizing antibody is against the fiber molecule. So replacing the fiber molecule of the Ag5 gives us the advantage of overcoming that pre-existing immunity, but maintaining the Ag5 structure gives us the ability to retain the high infectivity of the vector. So using the, those uh, previous patients in the previous uh, phase one clinical trial, when we did see the, the neutralization, we did see that, you know, obviously as expected, patients who had higher um, titers of neutralizing antibodies against Ag5, they continued to suppress, but the, the suppression was not that significant for Ag5 F35. So really in the previous iteration, we had 50% non-responders, but because of this intervention, we have reduced the predicted responders to, to 10% or less. And that's why you know, we are following or pursuing this uh, modified version of the vector um, called Ag5 F35 GCC or GUSI2C Potter vaccination. Um, and using this as, as a tool for a phase 2A clinical study in GI malignancies. Now, there are some key differences between the previous trial and this trial. Previous trial, we were only focusing on very low risk cancers, such as stage one and two cancers. We know that stage one and two cancers after surgery they have a very high cure rate. You know, 90% of them don't even recur. But now we're kind of expanding and we wanna see some clinical benefit of the vaccine. So not only we're enrolling colorectal cancer, we're also expanding to pancreatic ductal gastric and esophageal adenocarcinomas. One thing that you, you may remember from the last slide that, you know, immune response is a, is a, is a, is a, is a dependent, it's a time dependent. So um, we, we did see in the first iteration that giving one vaccine, you know, produces most immune response at 30 days and it tends to fade away. Now we want to kind of do multiple immunizations. We want to do three immunizations uh, every four weeks, um, so a 12-week period of study, and then we follow, follow the patients for two years, measure their immune responses, and determine, you know, who gets the cancer back in indirectly telling us the efficacy. Um, so that's the, that's the paradigm, and this is what we are actually hoping to start very soon here at Jefferson and um, kind of moving, moving the, the, the field forward. Um, and hopefully, you know, learn new things as we go along. Um, so in summary, um, checkpoint inhibitors have really revolutionized care, but unfortunately, they're not active in majority of GI cancers. Um, vaccination with the chimeric version of Ag5 F35 against QC2C has the potential to augment immune recognition of tumor cells and could reduce recurrence. Um, and obviously, we, we don't want to replace at this point vaccination as a therapeutic uh, option. We want to kind of use it after patients have already completed whatever is recommended, whether chemotherapy or radiation therapy, so they have the benefit of established therapies. And after we have demonstrated safety in the adjuvant setting, it will probably pave the way for us to future develop the vaccine in metastatic settings. And we could, you know, leverage the already approved um, checkpoint inhibitors in that space. One thing that excites me the most um, is that in contrast to checkpoint inhibitors, vaccine therapies have very limited profile of toxicities. And if we can you know, use them as an effective therapeutic option, we could leverage the power of immune system um, and not get as many side effects. And that's, that's what excites me the most. So thank you. Wonderful, and uh, thank you so much, Drs. Bashir and Lujimbal. We will um, have some time for a few questions, uh, um, and we ask any attendees to please use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. We have had some questions that have come in um, during the talk and some that came in um, during registration. 
Um, I'll preface that some are very specific and may not necessarily fall within your research scopes. Um, so feel free to, um, to elaborate on what you can and we can um, move on to additional questions. Uh, the first question um, asks if either of you are aware of any immunotherapy research um, or trials happening um, in metastatic breast cancer. Um, I, I can go. So uh, metastatic breast cancer, particularly uh, the, the worst type of metastatic breast cancer is the triple negative breast cancer. Um, the first immunotherapy trial that actually led to uh, an approval of an immunotherapy for triple negative breast cancer, and this was very unexpected last year, was atezolizumab with abraxin. And it is a therapeutic option for these patients. And, you know, it, it is not like the game changer, but it, it is an option that has become available. Um, there is a lot going on in that space. Um, a lot of patients, you know, I think I, the, the preface to this is what Dr. Luganbol said, um, you know, using some sort of vehicle to increase the, the power of immune system, such as Tadalafil, but here uh, people use uh, other, other drugs, established therapies, established chemotherapies. And um, so I, I see a lot of, lot of things happening in breast cancer. Uh, in, in immunotherapy space, and it's, it, it's an exciting time. Okay. Uh, speaking of Tadalafil, uh, we actually have a question on the data. If, if any of you are, if either of you are familiar with data on any recurrence rates in patients treated um, with Tadalafil, and if there's expectations for a difference there based on molecular differences. Sure, yeah, we, the, the data right now is certainly not mature enough to comment on recurrence and survival. Uh, 44 patients, all stages, all comers. Um, uh, I think we have two recurrences so far in that group, um, but overall, um, I wouldn't be able to comment on more than that. Uh, I do think uh, today I met with our bioinformatics person, uh, Dr. Galroff, um, who showed a really fascinating difference in the um, uh, when he did an unbiased evaluation of the whole exome sequencing and um, and showed that the Tadalafil was changing something molecularly, but he has not started to look deeper into what um, those pathways are. There is certainly an immune signature that we did see. That's no doubt about that. But there are other things that Tadalafil is doing that still remains a mystery. I said in the beginning, it's a no-go, go-no-go no -go strategy. It's not so easy, right? You finish and you're like, hmm, there's some exciting things that Tadalafil might be doing, but ultimately... Is it worth pursuing and continuing down that track? So often science stops before we know that answer. And Dr. Bashir, we have a question um, jumping off of Dr. Luganville's uh, talk. Do you see an opportunity to do window type trials with the vaccine for GI cancers? Is there a setting in GI cancer where the vaccine could be combined with other neoadjuvant therapies? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a great question. So. Personally, the answer is a, is, a, is a glaring yes. There's a lot of opportunity. But, um, you know, I, I, would, I would leverage Dr. Luganbol's presence here and say that not all surgeons think like Dr. Luganbol. <laughs> um, so, you know, it is, um, it, is a, it is a disease specific approach. I think what Dr. Luganbol has in head and neck space is not necessarily what we have in pancreatic cancer or colorectal cancer space. Um, I do think that the, the new adjuvant approaches that we have uh, for some of the GI cancers can certainly be leveraged um, to see whether there's an added benefit of uh, a vaccine type strategy there. Um, a lot of times, you know, um, what happens is that because you don't wanna kind of, you know, dirty your sample too much, um, and we know with new adjuvant chemotherapies that are given for six months, um, there is pathological response. There is tumor death. And what you wouldn't know at the end of it if you did a vaccine with it is what is coming from what. Um, and I think with, uh, with this window approach, if you can uh, you know, find a setting to do it is more ideal because you have shorter, shorter outcome and you have more defined you know, role of what is doing what. 
Um, and I think, you know, if, if that, was, that was the case, um, I, would, I would be very excited. I think, I think we don't have a lot of, you know, kind of window opportunities in the, in the GI space that I can, I can think of. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm, I'm, from the surgeon standpoint, I think I'm so enamored by what you guys discover and what you can do. Um, and I think the other thing is, is our group is set up such that uh, the surgeons are seen as a, as a real role play um, or player and they're not marginalized in the sense that we're given the opportunity. So every patient that comes in, besides thinking, how do I get them across the river? I'm also thinking, how do I enroll them in a trial? whether mine or somebody else's. So we all, all of us have been programmed, I guess, if you will, to be thinking as not, how do I operate and then pass them on for a clinical trial? It's how do I get them in a clinical trial? And if I get to operate, great, but let's see first if they're clinical trial eligible. And so it's just a, it, but that, that wasn't always the case. And I think it came with just some really good leadership, specifically, again, a, a, a nod to Uli Rodick and his, his wisdom them, um, which we or we're going to miss. And I think that that is a wonderful note to end on. Um, thank you both again. And thank you to everyone who uh, participated in this evening's discussion and submitted questions. I know we, we weren't able to get to all of the questions this evening, but I hope you'll join us um, for some of our other upcoming webinars and events. Next week, we'll explore the future of work, including the impact that coronavirus may have on the nature of work. And that'll be on Tuesday, May 12th with Chris Misiak from our Office of Career Services. Then on Wednesday, our Workout Wednesday series will continue as Lindsay Dunstan from the Physical Therapy Class of 2009 leads us through a 30-minute series of exercises you can do from home using your own body weight. You can sign up for these and all of our other upcoming events at jefferson.edu slash alumni events. We also ask that you consider supporting Jefferson's COVID-19 Better Together Fund. This special fund um, helps to provide support for the Jefferson community to ensure our students and employees are able to adapt to the ever-changing circumstances the COVID-19 pandemic has presented. You can do so by visiting jefferson.edu slash COVID funding. Be sure to visit our Facebook pages and download your own Zoom backgrounds uh, featuring photos from campus. Thank you all again for participating in tonight's talk. I hope you stay safe and stay well. Thank you. Thank you.